Hey, um, yeah, it works. Uh, I know it's a tough spot after the coffee break and before the barbecue, so beer with me. Uh, I hope every one of you will enjoy it. Um, just quick, I'm part of GRADE, Global Research and Analysis Team. We're mostly focused into APTs, highly sophisticated targeted attack investigations. That's usually the stuff what we're doing, but of course, uh, there are many, many more areas where this either gets into or new technologies um, which are out there. Um, why we are also doing research into these areas, like crypto, for example. That's also why. Crypto is something, um, it's not only for making money yourself, but many, many people, criminals and also APTs, certain specific ones got interested into that area. And that's also, of course, one interest why I'm doing investigations into that, but also the whole ecosystem, what's going on there. Uh, some people heard probably of Bitcoin, but to be honest, there is way more, and probably way more than you have heard about. So whether you're pro-crypto, this talk is for you, whether you're anti-crypto, this talk is as well for you, and if you have zero information about crypto, this talk is also for you. So um, let's get into it. I split the presentation up so we start slow with certain things which are more common and then we dig deeper, 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 deeper in order to make it like to unfold this whole um, story. I personally like to, to categorize a bit, um, so I'm starting with the more, from my perspective, outside threats from crypto, so not bound to crypto, more kind of copycat style of things, and then going into uh, um, the stuff on crypto as, uh, itself. Something which is mm, quite common, uh, it's known already for many, many years, so-called crypto checking, so you have malware or scripts or whatsoever trying to mine on the computers. Of course, everybody of us knows that Nowadays, you won't get far with mining on a regular computer because the computing power is simply not sufficient anymore. Uh, but still, it's a thing going on because new cryptocurrency is popping up, or if you have access to really large computing power, it could be interesting. Um, which, oh yeah. So one thing which is um, quite prominent in that area are nowadays botnets. So from the individual kind of malware pieces, botnets, it's a common thing. We know it from DDoS or whatever kind of stuff. And there are also um, botnets focusing on kind of um, crypto checking, so using the vast amount of computing resources uh, bundled into a, a botnet. A famous example is, for example, Kinzing, also known as H2 Miner, or there are some uh, more names as well. The interesting thing here is it's not only because it's written in Golang and it's an ELF binary, but it's constantly adapted to new vectors in order to increase the infection method. So usually you had this in the past, like, oh, yeah, there is a vulnerability or some known method, and the malware spreads out through that vector, and this is constantly added new vulnerabilities which are exploited in order to distribute the malware to gain more resources in order to make that kind of uh, crypto mining more profitable. Um, so that's common stuff which is going on. We know that, that that's not super crazy, but it's crazy how it's sometimes used, for example, abusing misconfigured Docker uh, installations, that's kind of crazy. So it's really going for the server level of environments, which is maybe not so cool when because there is computing power and maybe also critical installations and stuff like that. So things you really don't want on that. So make sure servers are secured. The most Kind of tip of iceberg from my perspective, it's a bit older story. Uh, it was some years ago, but still 
I, I really like to, to look at that is when some attackers uh, tried and successfully gained access to several supercomputers. The first one was the Archer in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland, um, followed by some more. The attacker were able to get through SSH, stolen credentials, into the supercomputers and started crypto mining on these supercomputers. And yes, there is a lot of computation power into that. And it also costs a lot of money for the ones who are operating that. So there are two uh, famous incidents which were uh, also uh, announced by the Security Operations Center of these kind of HPC uh, infrastructures, uh, even detailing how all of these supercomputers, um, I mean, probably most of you know a supercomputer is not just one computer like you have on your desk, but it's um, a bundle, like a cluster of many, many smaller entities. And the attackers started, <laughs> which is super crazy, to define roles for certain parts of this cluster. So you had one entry nodes for the SSH access. You had SOX proxies in order to allow connections through Tor uh, through SSH um, to control the instances. Then you had several proxy instances for the mining rigs and then the direct mining rigs itself. So it was really a huge thing which was going on. Besides malware and all of that stuff, we know from real-world attacks commonly uh, seen um, regular scam stuff, so we also have in the crypto spheres. Phishing, of course, um, fraud schemes, Ponzi schemes, all that kind of stuff, advance fee. Um, so you just pay a small amount, and if you pay that small amount, you get a bigger amount back. These kind of things, I mean, we know it from many, many different uh, financial areas, and that's the same here in cryptosphere as well. Um, fake um, coins in order to attract people to like pay money for things which do not exist, classical phishing stuff, uh, through emails, hey, we have from our crypto exchange, uh, you have an account, please, we need your details in order to unlock your account, stuff like that. You enter your backup words, like your private keys, uh, your funds are gone. And even going a bit further, um, I have it later as well. In crypto, basically you have a wallet, right? And this wallet theoretically kind of holds your crypto tokens. It's not the real reality because it's a bit more complicated, but to sim simplify it, let's stick to that. Um, you have software wallets and you have hardware wallets. So stuff like Ledger, for example, and Trezor. So you have a stick, USB stick, that kind of stuff, which is used in order to secure your funds, your access to your private keys, which control the crypto. And there are also these kind of phishing scams in order to try to get into your hardware wallets, which is kind of crazy because it's, from the technological side, a bit more complicated because it's not only, hey, give us your data, enter it here in this form, uh, we send it back and get access to your funds, but you have to have some additional step in order to bridge this hardware to the attackers, which then gain full access about your private keys. Fake exchanges, also a common thing for many, many years. These are just a few examples. Look, legit, like the common crypto exchanges, um, but in reality, every money you pay in, it's lost, done. Then we're going a bit more into the, uh, let's say, a bit more complex things, which is the theft kind of thing. Um, stealer is something which probably is known already. I mean, there are malware stealers, right? Uh, trying to uh, um, steal all the private data from a computer, all the credentials, yada, yada, all that kind of stuff. Fake apps, targeted attacks, this is also true in crypto, quite interesting. And you have some more advanced things like dictionary attacks, 
that's a bit more broad and more specific. Uh, but let's have a, have a look at some stealer things. Uh, one thing, and that was also one one point why I wanted to to definitely add to this talk. Uh, it was in March. Um, that stuff I even got because I was uh, observing these kind of things on Ubuntu. You have the Snap Store, right? Snap apps are the thing on Ubuntu systems. And they have this Snap Store. And you easily go there like Snap, install, and then any app you want to install. And there popped up some crypto wallets and also like Ledger applications, which is kind of weird because I didn't know that they were hosting their stuff in the Snap Store. So I downloaded the stuff, looked into it, and guess what? Of course, it was fake. It was no real apps. They were just there, fake apps. Uh, you open that, like you installed it, you open it, you entered your personal data, like your recovery passphrase, passwords, whatever, um, and they just shipped it back to the C2. Um, it was a huge scandal in that area, was reported to the developers and, and operators of the Snap Store. They removed all of that uh, and now introduced more strict uh, policies on that to make it harder for these kind of apps to get into the uh, the Snap Store or even disallow it. The problem was it's not only that these apps were there, but they were also marked as safe, confirmed, which definitely is a problem if you're not a professional and you see in an app store, oh yeah, this app is safe and uh, confirmed. You trust it, right? was not the case uh, here. Going to an interesting stealer, this one was from macOS. And that was quite interesting. That's really why I added it here as an example. Um, you know, there's pirated software, which is bad. Don't use it. Don't go into that because you have a huge chance getting any kind of malware. Same here. These operators, like the attackers, promise like, hey, here is this pirated software. Just download it and install it. So you get um, the Xcope that's uh, on the top left here, like the application, which was cracked. And then you have an activator. And this activator, usually in the cracked scene, is that it patches the original app in order to make it cracked. <coughs> Sorry. The case here is the app is already cracked, and the activator is just this add-on doing all the downloading stuff. So you open the activator because you cannot open the application itself. The uh, activator, of course, wants the credentials for the system. Uh, not good. Don't do that. Um, and when you gave it, uh, it starts patching just a few bits, just 16 bytes from the application in order to make it runnable, because that was the only thing they did in order to force the user uh, to uh, run the activator app. And then it downloads uh, some Python scripts, which was it here? Uh, ah, okay. Uh, it downloads some Python script. Um, which then starts, um, yeah, doing nasty things like um, going into crypto stuff, for example. But the interesting thing is how they did it. Because they're not doing it the usual way, going to a website, downloading an app or a script or whatever, and doing crazy stuff. They did it through DNS. <coughs> Sorry. It's a bit dry air here. Um, so, DNS, how did they do it? They sent a TXT request to a DNS server for a domain. The domains are generated by two static lists of words adding some numbers. So it basically brute forces through a lot of different domains, sends a TXT request, and if the correct domain was hit, it gets back three packets. 
The three packets combined together, base64 encoded, payload. It was also encrypted with AES, but that was simply uh, then decrypted, and then you have a full Python script, and that Python script then went on and did the stuff, which is kind of interesting. Like, how many people here monitor their DNS? Not enough. Congratulations. Very good. People really monitor your DNS. Um, that's also why I added it here, because that was kind of crazy. So they have um, additional, it's all in Python. So you have uh, functionality for Exodus Wallet, which is quite widespread, uh, and also Bitcoin Core. Uh, and if they find it, they exchange it with malicious ones, and the malicious ones simply does, if you enter all kind of, crit uh, of uh, critical information, like the passwords uh, and the passphrase, it sends it back to the C2, and your funds are gone. <laughs> bit more advanced was the so-called double finger. Also, interesting kind of stealer. Uh, this one comes through email uh, with a malicious attachment. And if you execute it, it's a bit more complicated because this one goes through many, many different stages and has certain stages into PNGs. Um, so, for example, this image is the payload of the stage three. So they added a lot of obfuscation techniques for this more or less quite interesting stealer in order to hide it, what it's really doing. So going through every step, trying to download more stuff, uh, and everything basically, like every interesting thing is hidden in a PNG. Most of them you cannot view. That was the only one you can like really see an image. Uh, and at the end, it creates um, a schedule task, interesting persistence, and also downloads the final binary, which is the uh, greeting ghoul stealer, um, which adds two different things. On one side, it has an overlay for different wallets, yeah. and on the other side, um, it tries to steal wallet information which is on the computer. So again, it tries to also go into hardware wallets. So you have an overlay. When you run your uh, wallets, you plug in your hardware, you enter the details, details get sent back to the attacker, your funds are gone. That's it. So as I said, that's the more common thing. Let's go into the crypto-specific one, and that's where it gets interest. First of all, simplified. This is really simplified. In crypto, we're talking about different layers. So you have the core layer of a blockchain, for example, Bitcoin or Ethereum. That's usually layer one. On top of them, most cases and nowadays you have like on Ethereum, you have a layer two. Layer two is added for scaling possibilities like Polygon, for example. Um, the idea behind Polygon is to make faster transactions, also with contracts, decentralized applications, which are then on layer three. That's just simple. It, you can compare it to like regular networking stuff, like you have the base ground, then the application layer, and that kind of stuff. There also are projects which are layer zero, uh, which are meant to bridge between different layer one applications. Um, there are just a few of them, but most of the cases, interesting stuff is layer one and up. So we're mostly talking about layer two, layer three, the continuum slots. And in these layer three, just to explain it a bit, we have so-called DeFi, for example. DeFi stands for distributed or decentralized finance. Um, so you don't have, compared to your regular finance system, what we have, you have a bank and you have customers, and that's like a centralized banking instance. In crypto, uh, you have a lot of projects 
doing this decentralized. So you don't have this one entity, but you have a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network structure, so you don't have one entity to control anything. That's the idea behind DeFi. You have NFTs. guess many people heard about that. I mentioned it later as well. Smart contracts. That's like the underlying core of most of that stuff, which are basically kind of programs, commitments. It's code, which is running on the blockchain in order to do certain kind of things, what the programmers want. We also have it later on. So what's happening in the crypto stuff, which is specific? Um, simple things which are um, kind of scam and fraud, but very specific. Pump and dump schemes, dangerous. Rug pulls, that's the thing everybody fears, basically. And address poisoning. A, no, come on. Ah, a pump and dump scheme. Basically very simple, and that's very painful for everybody involved. You have, for example, a lot of channels trying to like pump certain cryptos. The idea is that the scammer buys when a certain crypto is super low value, like just a few cents or just percentages of cents. And then they try to generate interest, as much interest as possible in order to attract more people to put money into this coin. When this happens, the price skyrockets, which is exactly the moment when the scammer sells. And then the price, of course, crashes and goes down, and everybody who is not fast enough will lose everything what they added. Um, there are many, many of these cases, um, so definitely something if you really want to go into not-so-known cryptos, this could happen, happen many times. A more dangerous one uh, are so-called rock pods. In this case, it's, um, it's an exit scam, which means that the developers themselves create a token just to get money and fake it. So happened here, this is a very uh, famous case, the so-called squid, uh, squid Game token. Uh, the creator said like, yeah, this is the token for the upcoming Squid Game game, and just get in, and you can exchange it in anything, and super crazy, super good coin. <coughs> People believed it, went into, bought the coin, quite fast realized that after buying it, they could not really sell it anymore, which is one trick which may happen into certain, these kind of rug pulls. And then uh, the developers basically sold everything, like they got the whole liquidity pool, which was created due to all the people who invested money, uh, deleted all the websites, deleted all social media accounts, and were gone. Uh, 3.3 .3 million dollars were made. Tricky. It's a tricky, tricky thing. Um, this guy were not really catched because it's really tricky how to go after these people. Uh, similar things happen on e NFT uh, as well. Uh, there was a project, this uh, Bella Ape Club, uh, basically kind of copycatting the Bored Apes Club. Maybe people heard about that. It's these crazy apes where people pay like millions of dollars for that stuff. Um, so they basically copycatted, uh, set it up, um, they limited to 5,000 NFTs. Investors got in, paid a lot of money. Um, in total, it was like 2 million, right? And when the developers got the money, they shut down everything, gone. <laughs> These guys, they got. And they're, um, it's kind of wire fraud thingy which is uh, going on there at the moment. 
This clicker is a bit slow. Okay. Address poisoning, um, I mentioned before. That's a thing which is a bit more crazy as well because you don't really see it. So in crypto, when you have, when you have some tokens and you want to send it to another address because you want to buy something. Simple example. So you got this long address. Copy it, add it to your wallet, send the funds, done. Address poisoning tries to exactly go into that and poison the address book with similar looking addresses because who is checking all of these long addresses character by character by character? Most people check the beginning and the end and then send the funds because, nah, should be the correct address. Um, and they try it often. Like usually you have it in wallets, you s transfer, like you see that in a wallet address is active and there are funds. And then attackers try to transfer either small amounts of some shitcoin or in many cases also NFTs, which are worthless. It's just an entry. Like there is zero value behind that. And when you start interacting with it, like deleting, burning, whatever kind of stuff, or sending it back, the address gets copied into your address book, and the next time you want to send funds, you get this as a suggestion. A good example may be seen here. Um, so the intended address, the first characters and the fake address are same, same for the ending characters. And that's what usually people check. Like, who is checking all of the different characters? But especially the ones in the middle are changed. So it's not the same address. In this scheme, the attacker really tried over many, many transactions to fine-tune the address poisoning after every action that finally he was able to get six, uh, uh, $68 million dollars. Because the owner of these 68 million in crypto transferred it to a poison address. Uh, so be careful about that. That's the whole scheme, like the different um, scammer wallets, and he transferred it to a change now address, like several ones. Change now is a DEX, a decentralized exchange, in order to send it there, exchange it to other token to hide who is the real owner of the crypto. So look out for that. Which brings us to a more complicated things. Vulnerabilities. And that's exactly the thing what's happening on either layer two or layer three, depending on um, where it sits. The blockchain, the distributed apps, smart contracts, it's code. And what do we know about code? Code may have vulnerabilities, which is bad in case when it handles money. And we're talking about not just a few dollars, we're talking about millions. Um, so you ha either have that's in the code, or you have logic problems, or there's also some more strange ones like compromise stuff. Let's go through a few of them. Uh, in total so far, that's like an official chart. You can check this on DeFi Lama, which is a great resource for these kind of stuff because they're tracking a lot of things going on. Uh, so far, more than $8.2 billion are lost through hacks. Schemes, I'm showing in a bit. Uh, and you can clearly see like where, yeah, 2001 basically it started, 2002, 3, 4. Already now we got quite some big hacks in this, um, ecosystem, like in May. Just five attacks uh, and more than 370 million. So the numbers are million. That's why I wrote it here. 
if I would have said it to million, you wouldn't have seen the other numbers, so it made no sense. So I adjusted it to make it more visible. Uh, so that's quite a number. And even in June, we are now in June, it's like 6th of June. We already had one hack at least till now, uh, losing more than $6.8 million. It happens. So, what's happening? Uh, end of May, just <laughs> not so long ago, uh, like less than two weeks ago, right? Um, a Japanese exchange, DMM Bitcoin, lost um, more than $300 million uh, in Bitcoin, like more than 4,500 Bitcoin. It was the eighth biggest theft so far, uh, which is quite a number. Uh, this one was the third part because it was a compromise of private keys. And that's really a danger, especially when you have like centralized exchanges. In many cases, these centralized exchanges need to store the crypto somewhere. So they have these big wallets. And when you check the public block exchanges, uh, uh, explorers and check the wallets with like huge amounts of crypto in them, in many cases, it's from exchanges. So they're holding a lot of um, crypto, a lot of value of the customers. And if someone is able to gain access to these, like with the stealer or stuff we've seen before, money is gone. Done. End of the game. A bit more complicated is when we're talking about DeFi, like in this example. Um, that was Woofy. It was also just, yeah, that, that was the, the one in June. That's why I picked it. Um, because I wanted to give uh, some fresh examples as well. So it was just like four days ago. They lost about 6.8 million in Ethereum. And they had a problem in their SPMM. Um, so let me explain this a bit. Because that's, um, no. Now that one was, sorry, not the SPMM, that was the fee one. So, basically in this scenario, you have a um, centralized DEX. And for every transaction, you have fees you pay, right? Because someone needs to pay the underlying infrastructure. That's for Bitcoin, for example, what the miners get, or in Ethereum, the owners of the, uh, uh, um, the nodes get. They get like this percentage of a fee when you do a transaction or any kind of activity on, uh, on the blockchain. So what they did here was um, that they have this fee. It's called effective fee 1E9. Was not checked properly. So it was able to go beyond 100%. So this is something not good because um, you can basically do a specific attack. That's what the attacker did. Um, he got a very huge amount of uh, crypto, called this um, code, and was able by going over the 100% fee underflow to change the transaction from I give you to you give me. Because when it's a negative amount, which is happening in this under, uh, over underflow, you get it back. So he basically changed because of this wrong act, uh, method handling of this fee calculation. He changed this giving money into getting money of a huge amount, uh, which happened here of like, yeah, this 6.8 million. Um, not good. I've seen many of these kind of attacks. And here it was like, that's a problem also with DeFi. Maybe to add to this. 
the attacker used the so-called flash loan. So on a DeFi, you can take a loan, so-called flash loan. So you borrow money, do something with that, like certain crypto money, some token, and after a certain period, you have to pay it back with a fee. So he didn't invest money by himself, really, but he borrowed money, a huge amount of money, like a huge amount of money, he used this exploit, he paid back the loan, he paid back the fees, and what was left was his profit. And that was the 6.8 million. So the money involved was a bit higher than the 6.8 million. Um, it was, I think, last year when I um, also gave a talk about crypto, where I gave a few more of these kind of examples. So especially when it comes to flash loan abuse, on distributed exchanges and DeFi, there are many, many methods uh, what people could exploit. And this was very prominent. Like um, They fixed it, so it's good, but can happen. So and that's the SPMM, Goofy. That was uh, in March, beginning of March. And that's super interesting. They lost uh, about 8.7 million. That's not the point. The point is how they did it. So when you imagine you have a distributed finance system or also a general finance system, you somehow need to have metrics in order to define the price, right? So you, when you go on an exchange and you want to buy Bitcoin, for example, let's stick to that example, there is a price. At the moment, I think it's like... $65,000, something like that. Somehow this price needs to be defined, right? Because we're talking about code, we're talking about crypto, also in regular finance, there are algorithms behind it. It's not a person saying, oh, Bitcoin today will be 65000 So you have so-called price oracles. And these price oracles are algorithms, especially here in DeFi, which define the price based on certain metrics. And this Woofy, uh, it's a distributed exchange. They introduced an own additional algorithm, which is the so-called SPMM, Synthetic Proactive Market Maker, which is like working together with the price oracles. And they basically define the price of a crypto. Clear? Okay, nobody is, okay. We're still in the same boat, right? Okay, I take this as yes. So, what the attacker did here as well, he borrowed money, same scenario what we had before, and he bought quite a lot of money. 7.7 uh, .7 million Don't. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, the attacker borrowed money uh, again um, and sold it. Like he he borrowed Wu and sold it directly on this DeFi again because of the amount, like the seven point seven million Wu, what he borrowed and he sold it. So he sold seven point seven million Wu. And one take. What did the price oracle say? Oh my God, someone is selling. So psh, value going down. And that's exactly what happened here. So the price of the Wu basically went to nearly zero. <laughs> uh, that's a problem with wrong price oracles. Um, and then he swapped Wu for this like low price. He did it three times, and at the end, profit. He paid back the loan, profit. 8.7 million. That's a thing, as I said, I've seen many times already because I'm constantly like 
monitoring what's going on. Um, so it's a problem that certain contracts seems not to be checked properly. Nowadays, there are companies doing checks of smart contracts and these kind of things. Uh, so we are on a good track. But now, still, we see several of these kind of attacks. So keep that in mind. Uh, it's not talking against the companies. Vulnerabilities can happen. Exploiting can happen. The companies still exist. They cover all of that in most cases, either through insurances or whatever. They fix the bugs, but there is a certain kind of risk involved. So it's not an argument against crypto whatsoever. But what happens when the attackers got crypto through any of the methods shown before? We're talking about blockchain. Blockchain means you have a huge book where every transaction is written down. So everybody can see where certain money was transferred to at what time. That's why um, either on smart contract or also on other methods, there are so-called mixers. These are three prominent ones, and just to say it, all three of them are sanctioned. So I would not suggest in any way to use any of them. It's just to explain you what criminals in most cases do, not only criminals, but we're focusing on criminals, right? Um, in order to hide what they were doing. So these mixers try to split up all the incoming stuff, send it to other addresses in order to hide the real origin of certain funds. Um, that's mostly, as I said, on DeFi because it's decentralized. On centralized exchanges and also many, many regular and regulated entities, you have a so-called KYC, know your custom. So behind every value there, every account on certain exchanges whatsoever, the owners know who is behind it in order to avoid fraud, to track down criminals, yada, yada. Um, there are initiatives, especially on this layer three in most cases, uh, working without KYC uh, in order to follow this path of privacy, but it always has a certain drawback, right? Um, criminals may abuse it as well, uh, so it's just, yes, there are these methods up to everybody who wants to use it, because it's not that nothing happens. It was just recently that the crypto checker got arrested in Ukraine, the developer of Tornado Cash, one of the mixers, got arrested, uh, the US Office of Foreign Asset Control uh, knows and lists in their sanction list over 600 49 addresses, mostly on Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, but also certain other cryptos. So it is observed what's going on because, as I said right in the beginning, it's not only low-level criminals or whatsoever, but also APT kind of actors uh, and also huge amount of money is involved nowadays. So, of course, officially, officials are investigating it which is a good trend, I would say. So, I just got less than a minute left, which is good. I'm good in time. So, I mean, honestly, I could talk on for many, many more hours. I left out specifically a lot of topics um, because really we could talk for hours about certain aspects and even going deeper on many, many of these things. I just wanted to share with you a certain overview to give you some insights into areas I hopefully you haven't really digged into, or if you have, you've seen new things and more things. It's not to create fear. It's not to make people bullish. It's more transparency. We need to talk about that, and especially what we can do. 
So, which my fourth point. Suggestion, if you are active or you want to get active in crypto, it's simple, simple as usual. Updates, simple blind trust is not a good advice. Use hardware wallets uh, and use official sources. Then you're already on a good track and then use your mind as usual. There's so much fraud going on. Um, so yeah. If you have any questions, I'm here later on as well. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, let's talk about crypto or also other stuff. And uh, thanks. Perfect. In time, more. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely.